Michelle. Daniel. OG, OG Rose. Rose. And today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the thoughts that came up in a recent Net conversation, Net 41, where we talked about Verveke's uh, Neoplatonism. We talked about Wolfgang Smith's vertical causation. And we talked about how a lot of it relates with Hegel because notion and nature are really tied together to uh, connect with Mr. Holgate's thought, Dr. Holgate's thought on Hegel, and how interesting it is, all these different parallels and overlay. We also talked about the notion that all phenomena entail a negative one, a less than zero from Zizek's um, book, but also the neg negative one is Lacan, and this is precisely what makes everything dynamic and moving and alive, which then moves it into freak theory. And then that negative one was interesting at the end. We were talking about how if everything has a minus one, then that makes everything a 99%, which then makes uh, Lehman Pascal's uh, metaphysics of adjacency. So then everything mm -hmm. is a dynamic and alive. And then I was just emailing Chitan about maybe we can think about Deleuze and the new materialism as saying that everything has a plus one, where in dialectical materialism, everything has a negative one. Mm -hmm. And that's why things are alive. And then, you know, Cadell in his lecture, uh, where we're saying in Deleuze, maybe the rhizomatic... Um, thinking of Deleuze describes the animal kingdom, whereas Zizek describes the formation of the subject, and the mistake is using Deleuzean's thought and overfitting it from the animal kingdom onto the formation of the human subject, and you have to conceptually mediate Deleuze, and then you can bring Hegel and Deleuze together, although it should be noted, I think uh, Mr. Downs recently, um, they had a wonderful article from Theory Underground talking about how Lacan and Deleuze are not the same, and that is indeed the case. You know, I went down that massive rabbit hole of trying to read all of Deleuze <laughs> as much Deleuze as I could, mm -hmm. and indeed, Lacan has a kind of fundamental negativity at the heart of being, wherein Deleuze, um, at the heart of being, is something very alive, very active, vitalism, Bergeson's vitalism, so there is mm -hmm. a difference, but... Um, if indeed there's, we're doing some of this um, non-reductionism, this emergentism kind of thinking, then you could say that there's a kind of ray in which maybe new materialism, because that, that's a phrase that is very Deleuzean, that's vitalism, new materialism, whereas Hegel is the dialectic materialism, that's a term from Zizek, um, and that would be the, the less than zero, the negative one. Perhaps there is something about Deleuze that describes the animal kingdom, where is a plus one vitalism, whereas once you have the emergence of the consciousness, then you're, you you got to bring in dialectical materialism, and that's going to be a negative one. And then that would be interesting, because then, you know, Ebert's formula, the formula he'll talk about with freak theory so often is negative one plus one equals zero, right? Where you get a new equilibrium. And how interesting would it be if the interpenetration, to use a Brevaki word, between subjectivity, the human subject, and then human biology is in fact kind of overlaying with the freak theory as an equilibrium as a whole that then as that equilibrium then in its very nature destabilizes itself back into the split between the positive one and the negative one ever back and forth in the wave structure ever new sublimations that have new equilibriums on and on and on and on in mm -hmm. that different structure mm -hmm. so the conversation today was delightful uh mm -hmm. and covered a lot of things but i'm extremely interested in thinking together like this new this neo i just can't help but hear so much in this neoplatonism that viveki was talking about in his you talk um, keynote. It sounds so much like Hegel's Science of Logic, and again, I always am paranoid that I'm reading into things. <laughs> but okay. you know, it, it's extraordinary to me the potential overlays that mm -hmm. could be going on there. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's um, that was really great, Daniel. Thank you for for all of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's something about, and and this has come out a bit in in um, you know Javier Rivera has that video about like the introduction of Hegel and yeah. in the phenomenology of spirit and basically how there is something that's um and you you bring draw this out in your talk that you had the Ojo Rose conversation with Javier right. about like how yeah it's funny because there's something kind of uh like you know gutsy about like Hegel to be like you know look you don't actually in a sense you you can actually look on and see this see what what I'm saying <laughs> yeah Hegel's like you don't world. have to read me just pay attention to the world <laughs> yeah and then you'll still see me <laughs> yeah right but I mean he doesn't you know it, it depends on maybe your perspective of like of Hegel to see that as actually like, you know, that he's being, there's something strangely like he's getting out of the way or he's saying that like what I'm saying is actually just truth. It's, it's like the, yeah, the it's of reality. extremely humble yet extremely arrogant. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We but is a scientist. But then it's funny because it's not arrogant if it's right. Is a scientist exactly. right? You know, that's what's yeah. weird. Is a scientist arrogant? Yeah. Yes, no, yeah. right? Yeah, and so in that way, it it's sort of 
kind of makes sense that in in the great conversation as we like to to call sure. it or maybe maybe there's someone who called it that but sure. i know that's the term that i first ever heard from you daniel sure the great the great conversation over you know the years and years and years and years of people after truth after all of life's deepest questions it it makes sense then then if if it is true what Hegel says in his introduction, basically to the phenomenology, phenomenology of spirit, then it would make sense that people who are engaged, genuinely engaged in this great conversation, would happen to, in a sense, like I don't, I don't really want to attribute it necessarily to Hegel himself, sure. but what Hegel is identifying that is the tr- the the reality of existence, the fabric of reality. It's it, it's going to be we're going to see that. Then in right. anyone who's participating in that car- great conversation are going to see that, and you know, uh, I so I think it, that that's important because in, in this way, then it's not so much about you know because I, I like I like to always remember that you know every idea, all of our ideas. Well, I kind of believe we're all like vessels for those ideas, sure. so we're not necessarily it's not even something that like you know it's it's not necessarily our idea that's why it becomes very egoic when we think of it as like it's mine and like it's like the kind of golem effect like possessive effect with our thinking and our our philosophizing but yeah but at the same time like for the sake of relations we understand it as this person had this idea you know that it's like we get inspired or we get motivated to think about things in different ways because of each other and that's good that's why we do have names that have identities (laughs) and so yeah it's like it's Hegel but it's not Hegel in a, in a sense, but yeah, I think I think there's something really rich and profound about Hegel's thinking that is so uh, that is that is so in line with the concrete reality that therefore we, we can see it play out uh, in other ways, even by people who are not even you know thinking at all about um, about what Hegel's writing says, you know, and so so it's this funny thing, you know, where it ends up being because again Hegelian. And then we can think about Hegelianism as something that can be potentially derailed right. from Hegel, right? That's not even close to Hegel. And maybe that can be what starts to become things that then, you know, thinkers critique Hegelianism, right? But then they end up being very Hegelian themselves because the idea at its core is something about truth. Absolutely. You know, it's about truth, not about Hegel. It's about truth. And so, yeah, I think that that's really funny because I, I guess, I mean, I think of just one last thing when i think about the idea of it being like oh that's so that's so fascinating because there's something actually quite hegelian in what this person's saying right whether there's somebody you know like for or or anyone else it's like there's something that almost sort of feels like yeah that makes sense right because yeah. there's there's like this like yeah because i mean the nature of reality in a sense is dialectical this is yes. not to like reduce it to dialectics and there could be the re- this reductionistic idea of dialectics which is not correct sure. but the but the, the the fullness of the sense of what that word means is is the nature of reality yes and so yeah it, it, it is fascinating but i think i think the main thing too is to just recognize this 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 potential for overlap and so that we can kind of be more open to understanding and having the actual dialogues instead of getting so hung up on was already said who said it da, 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 yes. da. just like yes. well wait all of this is about truth any like being after truth whatever that is wherever it may lead us anyway so absolutely let's well, go with that well there's a there's a few things um first off no one has to go around and say i'm a newtonian or i'm an einsteinian mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. I, like if it's a scientific theory and you just follow it you, you, it's like it's not in a sense it's not newton and yet it is, right? Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. this weird thing where if mm-hmm. Newton discovers it, and I know Newton, Newtonian physics is incomplete and overturned, and Einstein's even overturned, et cetera, so forth. But it's kind of interesting because scientific paradigms are not things where you have to identify with. They become invisible. Precisely because it's like Ebert says, where it's so saturated. Yep. Like, it becomes the paradigm. If it becomes a paradigm, no one has to claim they're a Newtonian mm-hmm. you, because you are a Newtonian. The weird thing mm-hmm. is that basically what Hegel is claiming is that his, like, if you're a Hegelian, you're not Hegelian. Exactly. Like, exactly. this is the weird move where he's like, I'm not, this is not Hegelian philosophy. If you literally pay attention to the world, it follows a dialectical structure. Mm-hmm. This is, and that's where, like, with Chiton, I think he's correct. Deleuze would be like, the problem with the dialectic is it's everything, and therefore it's nothing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Hegel, you know, and Hegel would be like, no, no, that's exactly the point, is that you can't use it because it is. Like, Deleuze would be like, you can't use it because it's everything. And Hegel's like, exactly. 
You don't use gravity. It is. You know, you then <laughs> yeah. you yeah. then design around gravity. Like, do you, doesn't it, here's a question. Does an airplane use gravity? It doesn't really use gravity. It's designed around gravity. It's mm-hmm. designed with mm-hmm. gravity. You see what I'm saying? So Hegel is like, no, you don't use dialectics. You live with them. Mm-hmm. And this is the crazy move. This is why Hegel is like, no, no, no. Like, he, he, I, I, like I, I mentioned in the talk, like Hegel's like falsify. Like he would want to falsify. He's like, you falsify that. Find me something that isn't dialectical. He's like, find me something that is not dialectical. And when you get that dialectical is not an epistemological method, but an ontology, yeah. AB yeah. ontology, you know, Todd McGowan talks about contradiction, you know, dialectic contradiction. We have all these terms based on the emphasis that we're going for at the time of the conversation. Like everything is a becoming. Mm-hmm. It is a being that becomes in the moments of being, it's becoming something else and everything is changing. Find an entity in reality that does not have this structure. Mm-hmm. And Hegel's like waiting. Mm-hmm. So he's like, so, th- so this is the move. Like... Whatever philosophy is true is not that philosopher's philosophy. In the same way that whatever science is true suddenly in a weird way is no longer that scientist's science. Mm-hmm. They discover it, but you're, but you're not a Newtonian. Yeah. This is where, this is what, this is Hegel's bold claim. And the crazy thing is, is it seems to map onto reality. And this is where, you know, where Viveki is so interested in Michael Levin's work, where Michael Levin is like, look, these xenobots... If you separate them from any causal agents that would lead them to evolve into, you know, a higher ordered organism, seem to magically, according to a platonic formulation or telos, formulate themselves, which then seems to be scientific evidence of what Wolfgang Smith is calling vertical causation, right? And so, and so, you know, for Viveki, that's evidence of forms, like platonic forms that things are operating in. But then for Viveki, this is what's interesting, is like, but unlike, unlike... Plotinus, Plotinus, I don't believe in the two worlds. I don't believe in a transcendent one or different things. I think that the forms are part of the things themselves, right? That That's completely Hegel. Like, nature and notion are two sides of the same coin. Like, Holgate, like, like Holgate talks about where, and this is so important, where he's basically, and then, then it gets real nuts because it's like Steiner now. It gets into mm-hmm. Rudolf Steiner, mm-hmm. Owen Barfield, the entire modern counter-enlightenment. Like, yep. Holgate says with Hegel uh, that that basically you can say nature is formed of chemicals. You know, it's just all chemicals. But in Hegel, chemicals formulate themselves according to the laws of logic. They follow a kind of telos. They have a form. This is what's like, arguably, like what I guess I'm extremely curious about is that Verveke's Neoplatonism basically strikes me as Hegel's negation sublation of Plato. Like, you know, where Viveki's like taking Neoplatonism and putting it together with Zen Buddhism and, and you know, trying to avoid two-worldism. Well, that, well that's, that's the way that Hegel sublates Plato because Hegel, Hegel has a deep respect for Plato. Cadell really, really emphasizes this. But he wants to negate sublate Plato into nature. Notion and nature are two sides of the same coin. Like, nature produces its own formulating principles. And that is... Like, I guess I'm interested because this would suggest that, like, where Verveke is, like, the, the, only meta, the only ontological metaphysical tradition he can find for what he's looking for is Neoplatonism. Um, well, it, I think it's actually the counter-enlightenment. Uh, you know, it's the counter-enlightenment, and then, as you know, I think Hegel leads into a modern counter-enlightenment, and that his take on Neoplatonism, because I think he himself would be like, well, no, what I'm calling Neoplatonism is not identical with classical Neoplatonism. Well, he's taking the Neoplatonist tradition and in a very important way, I'm not saying it's wrong at all. I'm saying it's a very valid neo-reading of Neoplatonism. Um, But actually it fits with the tradition as far as I can tell. Well, it seems to me to utterly fit with the thinking of Hegel, which to me is remarkable because, um, well, that would of course be evidence of Hegel, right? You know, if everyone, you know, like you're saying, right, that would just be evidence that that Hegel's structure is right. If people who think, this is the point, if people who think they have nothing to do with Hegel are in fact ending up by their own devices, on their own thinking, in Hegelian logic, that would be all the more reason to think that what Hegel is describing is indeed the case. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a question for you. Yes. Uh, When this idea of the, this idea of the um this idea of um of well, when Chitan was talking about this this idea of like well you know if it's everywhere then it's kind of like it, remi- it it reminds me of Boltriard's contamination 
It reminds uh, me a little bit of his idea that it's like, well, if everything is sexual, then nothing's sexual. Yes. Now, I think the the thing is, is that in, in Hegel, um, this is what's this is what's so fascinating is that he does a, He's very particular and very aware of this kind of when nothing becomes everything. Yes. And when uh, and and this interplay between the everything and the nothing. Yes. Um, but but what I, what I think is that it's it's a fairer concern, right? Of like, well, very. If if it's everywhere, if it's everywhere, like so, let's take that little phrase and think about it with uh, you know, with sexuality, like Bolger is saying, right? If everything is is sexual, then nothing's really sexual. Now, people could disagree with Bolger, first of all, with what he's saying, uh, but we can have different understandings of what that exactly means. Now, I think now I have to I have to put that on pause for a second. When I think about the, what this could mean in terms of this nothing becoming everything again. So flip flops, right? It be, it's everywhere, right? The dialectic is everywhere. So then it, it maybe it's nothing, and it, it almost like kind of invalidates itself, right? Because now we're just totalizing with it. Well, is air totalizing? Like yes. air is everywhere, right? It's it's this kind of like it's something that is actually in our our experience of reality that we we breathe by, right? We breathe by, and so. There's something about this idea that we don't think we it's so it's so everywhere that we don't ever see it. Right. But we all live through it and buy it. And that's kind of that's why I often think of philosophy like error. You know, I, I talk about the elements, right? Like religions more like earth. Error is more like philosophy because we're always using it, but we don't ever think we see it. Right. You know, Dimitri, Dimitri, you brought that up today at the talk too with the net, where it's like it's very difficult because this is stuff that's like unseen, right? We yes. don't have anywhere to point to it exactly, and yet this is like philosophy is what we're all operating by. We just don't realize it. Yes. So for me, that's the that's how I would get. That's how I would maybe approach Chitan's really, which Chitan brings up a great point. But that's maybe how I would think about approaching it. But Actually, um, you know, Javier had brought up Baudrillard, where it's like, but what about what he said, which is very true, which is this idea that, you know, the, of, of contamination, where, you know, we see the risks of this with like everything being political, nothing's political, everything's sexual, nothing's sexual. So what's, why is that kind of whatever you want to call that, I don't know if that's a tautology or something, why is that kind of problematic, but it not problematic with the dialectic? It's an excellent question. Um, the reason is because you are always living through the dialectic. Like when you look at the dialectic on a sheet of paper where like we were saying, like if you have negative one plus one equals zero, it, it gives itself to you in its entirety and it's like, oh, it's nothing. But if you literally went into the syllogism, and this is why Hegel has those sex, those extraordinarily complex sections on syllogism and the science of logic. If you literally were the negative one encountering the plus one, becoming the zero, you do not experience it as a nothing mm -hmm. uh, because you do it one step at a time. This is the issue. The dialectic never gives itself to you in its entirety. It's always in process. And, yeah. and so the issue is, it is never, like where Deleuze is like, if everything is dialectic, then nothing is dialectic. The dialectic's never complete, though. This is why, this is Deleuze, this is Deleuze's, Deleuze has a reading of Hegel as total. He's totalizing. Yeah. So for him, the dialectic is a process of the totalization of nature. And for, and for Deleuze, he's like, well, if you're totalizing nature, then nothing changes. Well, that would be absolutely true. Yeah. I would, you know, hot take, Deleuze does not, in my opinion, Deleuze views absolute knowing as a point of totality, not as a absolute moment where the limitation of thought is essential to the development of thought. Yeah. Um, he sees absolute knowing as the, the, the full realization of rationality in history. Mm -hmm. And so then it's for him meaningless because then the full realization in history is whatever history is now. So nothing <laughs> happens. That's great, Hegel. That's real nice. <laughs> But the issue is, yeah. the, the, another way to look at this, like those, that bookshelf over there is ontologically dialectical, but you never experience it dialectically. You experience it according to understanding. There's yeah. a split yeah. in Hegel between understanding and reason. If reason equaled understanding, yeah. well, then nothing would occur, right? Yeah. But the fact that we are, in a sense, trapped in linear understanding, but have to know about reason and work understanding into reason means that the dialectic is never complete. So it so if the dialectic is never complete, if it's ever active because there's always a minus one, then actually technically here's the move. Hegel's like, well, Deleuze, you're right. The dialectic is everything, but everything is, has, a, has a minus one in it. 
So it's not. So it's like ninety nine percent for Deleuze's point to stand. It has to be a hundred percent. But the dialectic is fundamentally ninety nine percent, and so it's not everything. Therefore, it's not nothing because there's just enough space uh, to make it to where it's always alive, active, and that little missing blip of the negative one actually totally transforms the meaning of the other 99%. That's what's weird, and that's something Lehman Pascal emphasizes. Yeah, yeah. That's good, Daniel. I'm still trying to connect this back with Boltriard, but I'm thinking that there's kind of a difference of... Like, when Boltriard's talking about this problem, right, of things becoming, you know... Well, he's I, he's I, linking I, it with the death of the real, right, well, and hyper reality, and you can't tell the difference between the so the simulate the um the sim the, the the model and the real, right? So everything's similar lacra, right? And you can't tell like the copy from the original and all those different things. Um, so there's like an identification of reality where in Hegel reality is process. What you were saying? Yeah. Well, just the fact of the matter is, is that the 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 idea is almost that we. I think actually that his phrase that he's saying, right, uh, this idea that when everything, let's just go with the word political, when everything's political, nothing's, nothing's political. political right. What what he's what actually I think that's saying is actually to not, to to live as if somehow you don't have some dialectic. Like I guess what I mean to say is like, the reason those that happens is usually because we're not having limits. Exactly. Okay. That's so correct. so you you have this on and. And look, like history can go through these oscillations of like, you know, uh, more whatever we, what are the two terms, ritual and, and, but basically it's just givens and release. Let's use that yeah, language. I, that, that's, that's better anyway. You, you're, you're bringing in the profane, <laughs> sacred and profane. Yeah, time, yeah, right? yeah. It's kind of like the, the times when you have your, your prohibitions, you know, yes. and your yeah, restrictions yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, you have yeah, your yeah, times yeah. of release. So yeah, let's just right. say givens and releases. That's the language that you have, co- yes. that you've yeah. devised through, you know, Philip Brief. And that's really, really great and helpful. So what I mean to say is that what Baudrillard is pointing out is that because there is this kind of like uh, this proliferation, right? This pro- proliferation of so many things through a lot of times through media is what a lot of what he's talking yes. about, uh, xeroxing and and all of these sorts of things. But we have this proliferation of of um, the thing itself, right? And so then we it, we get away from the thing itself because of it being these copies. And right. like you're saying, what what he's getting at is that basically it 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 becomes nothing simply because we it, it hollows out. We don't have a way to get it back to what it actually is or yes, something because exactly. it, it's so inflated. Right. Which kind of is like the the meaning crisis from Ebert's perspective, yes. which is great. Where there's this, it's not that there's not meaning. It's too much meaning. There's yes. too many things yes. grabbing your attention. Being like right. this is meaningful. This is meaningful. This is meaningful. You know, and you're like completely overstimulated, right. overwhelmed. So, I think I think in that way, that is what Baudrillard is talking about. Yes. But the 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 concern can be like, but his language sounds a lot like, you know, you know, if it, when it becomes everything, it becomes nothing. Why isn't that the same for dialectics? Right. You know, because it, if we just look at it in terms of the words themselves, it, it seems like, well, if he's right about that, then that would be a problem with dialectics too, right? But there's a, but the thing is, I think you can never copy dialectics. There's no way to kind of, the, because it's like you're saying, it's a process, right? Yes. It's not something that you can even ever copy because it's it's something that is always unique to the relation itself for the moment the moment you know we were talking today yes. the net as well that hegel's very big on the moment yes. it's always in the moment right that it then trans transpires and it transforms so i guess i'm just trying <laughs> maybe i'm stuck too much in the language but i'm just like if i think bolger right with what he's saying like when everything yes. becomes political nothing is political but then why isn't it the case that when everything becomes dialectical, nothing's dialectical. Why does not that is not true then? Because dialectical is, is fundamental, like space and time. Like if I were to say everything is space time, that doesn't cause contamination. Like, are you saying that, like in a way, the sexual, political, all of these things are like accidental, yes, but like dialectical is essential that's if we correct. think of Aristotelian I, I, I terms? I mean, if okay. you want to be really that's, cr- that's helpful. I mean, if you want to be really crazy, <laughs> I mean, Hegel is basically saying space time is dialectics. Yeah, like I when think, you talk I think about so too. like you I can never so yeah. you can never separate space space and time. Well, if we get Ber- it will, well, frankly for Hegel, it would almost be time space Bergson. Right? <laughs> right, so right. you can never spa- separate time space, and dialectics is time space. Like well, it and, is time space. And this is like we shouldn't be too surprised by that. I mean, even though it's it is a very huge and pretty important profound point. But like if we think about the word itself, it is related. Though, and it's so funny to me because like 
dialect dialectical we talk about these things yes. but you know in, when i lived in spain like a lot of people speak dialects of mm. spanish it's it's a in a way i think of dialectics as the language unfolding or like yes. the process the of language, language of reality if you exactly use exactly those terms. Yes. and the thing is too what if we think about the word you know the uh, in spanish that's day yes. so it's like dialectical you know it's like this is this is about like the 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 t- like the sun movie <laughs> you know it's like well we're moving around the sun, but you know what I mean. The, the 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 this this move this movement this orbiting right this you know daily, and all of that is like so heavily connected to timing, uh, you know, and to time space, and so yeah, the dialectical being related to that is to me makes a lot of sense just etymologically. Well, I mean, if you if to to, to follow that example, you you can basically say logos is dialectic. You know, logos, like in mm-hmm. the beginning was the logos, the word and all that. And like, you know, logos. That's interesting. It's kind of like in the beginning was the dialectic. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. the logos the lo- is Logos is dialectical. dialectical. Yeah. yeah. Logos is dialectical because logos is time space. Yeah. Uh, and then you go, well, what is time space? <laughs> well, this is what's crazy. What? Because like if, well, what's crazy, uh, if nature and ocean are two sides of the same coin somehow, yeah. like we are seeing in Levin where you have like pain type of formulating principle, then... Time space unfolds according to notion. Like notion is in nature, and nature is in notion. Mm-hmm. So time space. This now. This is where it's tricky because we have to avoid a cheap, silly panpsychism. We have to avoid what you're dealing with now. Is you're not dealing with dualism, but you're also not dealing with a traditional monism. You're dealing with some kind of dialectical monism, which is strange. <laughs> where yeah. like the single substance of being is nature slash notion like notion is no notion is the abstract is the extra is the formulating principle abstract extractly of nature and nature is the manifestation of notion so that would be what it would mean to say that dialectic is fundamental. That that unfolding of this kind of dance of notion and nature that are indivisible and yet not reducible is, most, is the most fundamental description of reality. And so that's why it doesn't fall into Baudrillard's contaminant because contain- we're talking fundamental substance, if you will. Mm-hmm. And the fundamental substance is a dialectical monism. Uh, which is more time space, but then that's kind of like Bergson. That's why I think Bergson, um, Bergson, as far as I can tell, Whitehead, Owen Barfield, Steiner, and you know the way that Verveke is describing Neoplatonism, Hegel. They're they're all saying like a very similar structure, um, and so the dialectic would then be time space, and time space it it unfolds like notions do mm-hmm. like ideas i guess a way to think about it is if you follow the way the idea of say a cat unfolds yeah. that is structurally isomorphic to how nature unfolds and nate and so you could say time you could connect with notion space you could connect with nature and you're always dealing with time space yeah. so you're always dealing with notion nature and they are isomorphic, but but irreducible to one another. Okay, so so then if nature is the plus one, and the notion is the negative one, Lacan de, de Luz, then their interrelation together gives you the equilibrium of zero. But since they never actually equal one another, you never reach that total relation. That would be a kind of death state, and thus the dynamicity would die. Okay, like if you if they actually became zero, th- in like a tr- like a deep sense, then that would be the end of dynamacy, right? But the fact that they don't means that there's always that freak theory Alex Ebert dynamacy between the two, which then all of the unfolding of time space in through the universe as the manifestation of quote unquote logos is in fact that dynamic process. Yeah, they don't. That is always trying. This is what's weird. That's always trying to to achieve an equilibrium like the zero, but every equilibrium it reaches immediately, immediately breaks up and turns out not to be that final zero, uh, because nature and notion just as soon as they kind of come together and reach an equilibrium, split again. Like the plus one gets away. The minus, zero, the minus one gets away. Um, you, you see, and, and thus it moves for Zizek's title. Like just as soon as you get a, a stable state, it, it moves again, right? Because it's still 
alive. It's still there. And that seems to be, well, and then of course, if we're looking at Michael Levin's work with the Xenobots, then, then that formulating principle that you're seeing in the Xenobots, you just apply to the entire universe. Can you just share like two sentences two sentences on the Xenobots, please? So Michael Levin, what they've done is experiments that find that if you take certain cells and you separate them from the, say, apparatus of the entire cellular structure, um, it, that cell that is separated, and I think he calls them Xenobots when they form them, will like crazily organize themselves as if they're receiving magical communication from seemingly nowhere to act as if they are part of a larger organism and then begin to organize themselves as if they are, which makes absolutely no sense because there is no direct cause and effect to make them do that. There's no like intelligence or something. They seem to just know the teleological structure that they need to So it's form. like you, you get a couple of cells from a frog? Or, or he like talks he, about frogs, yes. Okay. And like, and they can somehow like basically they reform into a frog from like not all the way to a frog. I mean, I'm not so sure on the literature on that. Yes. But like a, a cell, like if I were to take like we would think that as say a skin cell, yeah, does what a skin cell does because it's receiving signals from all the other cells. Oh, I and, see. But like actually the part can somehow be like the whole even yes. though it's not attached to the yes, whole. Yes, basically that's a way to look at it. Like it's somehow, it's not with the whole but it's still with the whole somehow. It is and it will of begin like... to organize itself to relocate the whole and to recreate a whole yeah. from that part. So it's almost like it's maybe it's not, atta it's physically has some sort of distance but it still has some attachment in this kind of, it's almost like the concept itself is what then makes it operate, yes. even though it's not getting like the brain. Yeah, Michael Levin calls it free lunches. Like there's like there's like somehow <laughs> it's able joke. to create a free lunch. Like like the laws of like logic somehow directed, even though it's not clear at all where the laws of logic are coming from. So this is where Wolfgang Smick talks mm -hmm. about vertical causation. Mm -hmm. Like there is no horizontal causation anymore between the cells, and yet the cells act as if there are. So there's no horizontal connection. So the only way you can explain it is there's some sort of vertical causation that is, well, like a platonic form. Mm -hmm. Like the thing is still formulating even though there's no horizontal connection to make that cause and effect occur. Mm -hmm. You can't explain it by basic cause and effect. So, mm -hmm. well, if you can't explain it by basic cause and effect, you're talking form. You know, you're talking some, you're talking metaphysics. You're, you're talking ancient thought now. Well, yeah, and that's because like, it's like, well, it is the cell of the thing. So it, it, it has some similitude or whatever yes so it's almost like it has in it the whole yes. somehow even though it's just yes. a part yes um, yeah and this gets into like holographic universe theory mm -hmm. you know you have that where yeah. a holograph yeah. is where every like part every of moment is, yeah. is like it, sorry go ahead sorry. where yeah like every frame has all the information for the whole frame yeah well that's nuts then you know if yeah. the universe and that's you know when people call it I sometimes wonder if the holographic universe was not a really good name for it because then it sounds like the simulation theory of like Elon Musk and all that but basically as I understand the holographic universe theory it's basically saying that every point of the universe contains all the information for all the other points which then I believe that is Berkson you yep. know yep. you know I believe that is Berkson and there is some now I'm not sure if you can say in Hegel every point of the universe contains every other point of the universe but the universe unfolds according to notion yeah. like a, a telos like it unfold it unfolds according to vertical causation you know to use that language yeah well it's kind of when when you have been talking about this idea of like the the negative one and the one and and the this kind of idea, like it's funny, you can really only have equilibrium if you have some dynamicity, right? Like you yes. can't. That's that's the whole. Yeah, there wouldn't be. There would just be like nothing, <laughs> right? Like, what... <laughs> you know, yeah. if there wasn't a dynamic that comes to equilibrium. Yeah, but it reminds me a lot of like Buber's language of the twofold nature, the twofold. Yes. Like where there and and I remember from uh, one of, you know, Rivera has some really good videos on Buber, but one of them he was talking about like it's almost like a plant, you know, when at the top it has like it comes up from the same root, but then it goes there's the two parts at the top of the the wheat or whatever it is, and it's kind of like that's because in a sense that's that vertical the vertical has some sort of root down there yes. that then ha makes the plant grow up and then you know split into kind of the two, you know, and humans also have uh, from our conception 
this idea of like it's always this kind of two to be, become the one zygote and then the cells do this multiplication they start divide in two and divide and divide and divide and, and divide, divide it's and constantly divide. dividing it's always a one to two one to two one to two you know well that's a good example because the, the the zygote you know with the sperm and the egg they become one and what do they immediately do become split. multiple yeah, yeah. you know yep. they split the equilibrium spits just like that that's a good point yeah. um which then again if we use mr ebert's language if the so you know there's this other big movement in mathematics that ebert talks about where they want to get rid of the equal sign right there is no equal sign there's only equivalence so we always have to remember that negative one plus one never becomes zero in a sense mm -hmm. it is always becoming zero yes and that's that weird move that we like if zero so for him when he talks about the magnetic zero if the zero is kind of the vertical causation that is pulling the negative one of the subject toward the plus one of the the vitalism that defines the the animal kingdom or the body or the brain or whatever language you want to use when they come together and try to equal all they can do is equivalent equivalent and they split apart instantly like the zygote and then they keep doing that over and over again like it's as if the negative it's as if the subject notion is always trying to have new relation with the with 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 nature vitalism Deleuze, all that different stuff and every time there's a failure a kind of a kind of collapse that then pushes apart and redo and a redo and a redo and there was that and that would be a constant process of negation sublation um, because I'm, you know, I'm always fast you know, the plus one stuff I'm talking about to lose is very, you know, I'm not going to like die on a hill for that because I'm not so sure, but I'm always fascinated by this fricking Deleuze Hegel discussion because <laughs> like Hegel, there's something about Deleuze that seems like he's just begging to be fit with Hegel, but then there's something about Deleuze that seems like he can't be fit with Hegel and like what is going on? Like, new, do we really want to say that all of new materialism is wrong? Like this dynamic vitalist picture that Bergson and Deleuze and are like talking about that there's no truth to this. But then do we really want to say that there's no truth to dialectical materialism? That Zizek and Lacan and all these different people, you know, that, that's Lacan's, I mean Zizek's term that Lacan is talking about. So it, that seems crazy. But then if we follow like emergentism or the vector theory of a long and barred, where you have like the subject, emer so mind emerges from, from biology, Biology is the, the delusion, the plus one, that emerges to the mind, which is the negative one, and then between those is the dynamicy of the freak theory. Um, and they can never achieve equivalent, they can never equal one another, and yet they're pulled toward the zero, that magnetic zero, they're like put notion in nature because they are isomorphically, they are formulatively and fundamentally isomorphic, are pulled toward one another in a way. Because they're trying to find themselves in one another, but they but they can't <laughs> because they can't be reduced to one another, right. and that's the death drive. Maybe you know there's something about the death drive there, like notions like I want to just be nature, and nature's like I just want to be notion, and it turns out that all they can be is isomorphic and inseparable, but they can never be one another without that being the like death equilibrium like the end of dynamicism, but they have this drive to be one another because that would be the end of the dynamic, like the movement, the change, and they want the stable state, the Freudian stable state, right? Yep. So the emergence of mind from nature then creates this death drive between notion and nature, where like there's a death drive in fundamental time space per se to achieve this, um, you know, this oceanic peace, this, this, this stable state, that every time they come close to, unless like the fact that we're still talking means the universe hasn't ended, I guess, then they're pulled away, right? And then right. there's a new freak theory. There's a new movement here. And so trying to think Deleuze and Hegel together like that just seems like really important. Um, but then also thinking Deleuze separate from Hegel, I think clearly is very problematic. I think you, there's all sorts of problems with that. And, you know, I've talked about that with Japan and different things. So thinking those together just seems really, really important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I couldn't help but think about this idea of the uh, the death drive, the 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 uh, the this sort of the idea of like nature wanting like just wanting to be no, notion notion and vice versa, right? Like notion just wanting to be nature. It kind of makes me think of like love itself, like mm. the, the the consuming love when when th there's kind of this there's a there's a type of love that that wants 
to completely consume right the other and 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 be kind of almost like to not be able to not be with the beloved somehow mm. and the only th- tragedy is if you really if there was a if there really what if you really were able to consume the beloved you they would no you if you were really to be, if if the two were to really become one in a consumptive way now there this is why what's fascinating with like the consummation and the the language of you know the two flesh becoming one flesh in marriage and sure. that biblical language is very very fascinating because there's this tension of two and one mm. like it's it's always this sort of like yeah you're one flesh but you you don't you know you're still two people yes. you know yes yes and you and so this is kind of a love that then has to be it is still this kind of like I want to say it's, it 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 takes it from like maybe you could be like it 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 kind of um, directs that type of love from being consuming to being consummating like you you actually just let yeah. let the drive be toward that like the the libidinal libidinal energy right. is put toward that so so but let's jump back to this idea of this consuming love this consuming love is I would I would say it's more associated with like possession. And it's it can sometimes be, uh, it it it's the kind of it's a kind of love that's it it's never satisfied. Like it always wants more and more and more and more and more. You know, and like I think there's still going to be elements of wanting more in the the consummating love. That's the whole point, right? You you know, sure. it's, it's, consummation is never complete because it it it's 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 a it's a perpetuation, right? It's a act that then is building and in an, and it's repeated, right? Right. But the the but anyways the consuming love, it's this idea of like if we could only just please be one. But as soon as that happens, you're where is the beloved? Right. Where are they? How can you ever relate to them right. again? Right. Like you've 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 both you've both become one and nothing now at the that's same right. time, and that's a very it's it's a crazy thing, but it's really important to recognize about that, which is like you're ultimately gonna you're killing your beloved right. and you're killing yourself and there's no ability to now have love at all actually with this type of love that's why i call it a type of love you know because it's felt often like love but it's this it's it ultimately ends up being something that's you know again can be it 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 would it would kind of undermine the very thing it's after the very thing it's it's it wants to be or something like that what's well, very so interesting I, I, I no no what you're saying is very important um there's a way in which, like, we talk about marriage as two becoming one, but the moment that one is achieved, then there's a two. Like, there's, like, the, the coming of one is immediately, oh, you're not who I thought, you know, you're, we don't, yeah. there's a differentiation. Yeah. But what's interesting is in the same way that Hegel suggests that the way chemicals unfold according to notion is different than when chemicals unfold without notion, there's a difference between two people of whom see themselves as one being two people and two people that don't see themselves as one, that the notional construct in which those two are situated changes those two in their nature and how they operate, right? And that's a notional nature of relation right there. Like when you say like, oh, it's not like in marriage, like two people literally become one and yet there's a change. There is yeah. a change because yeah. there's a notion. The notional change has natural changes. Absolutely. There is changes in nature. What's interesting about this is if this all follows, it's kind of funny to think that we're always asking, can we get to the thing in itself in Kant? And we're always like, no, we can't. Well, it seems like we can change the thing in itself. <laughs> like even yeah. if we can't reach the thing in itself, yeah. we sure as heck can change it. So if we can change it, then mustn't we be reaching it? Like, and this is the, that's the big Hegel move. Where he's like, no, the idea of the thing in itself is precisely the limiting factor of which then means you are part of the constitution of that thing. So the very fact that we can change things, just like we described, would suggest that you do somehow reach the thing of itself. You never, let's put it this way, you never reach the thing in itself, you always, but you do change the thing in itself. That, which is... Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Because that would suggest that the problem, maybe the problem with the whole discussion with the, you know, and as we've said a million times, there seems to be a difference between Kant and Kantianism, so that it has to be marked. We're always talking with Kantianism, can we reach things in themselves? Maybe that the problem is actually the word reach. Maybe we're always befuddled by that because we're asking, can we reach things in themselves versus can we change things in themselves? 
And if we uh, and if we ask, can we change things in themselves? It's pretty clear we can. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty freaking clear we can. We do it all the time. So the problem in that sense is over, because it's like the me- well, that's not true. Because we were saying today with the meta question, right? Like you can't answer the meta question, and that's the answer to the meta question. Like there, like the inability to answer the meta question means the meta question is not a thing you answer, but a thing you constitute. Like in the very relation to it is the constitution. The limit is the constitution. Right. So the the very changing of the thing in itself is the reaching of it. But you can let's put it this way. You can never reach it and not change it. That's the Hegelian move. And Kant, like you're asking, can you reach the thing in of itself and like reach it? And in, in Hegel's like, oh, no, you, you reach it, but it changes when you touch it. But you do actually touch it, though, <laughs> you know, and it's just always changing. And so that is also then how you link nature and notion. Like, if the question is... Because then you could reformat it. Can notion reach nature? Like, because nature would be in a thing of itself, right? Can notion reach nature? Can two people in marriage become one? You would say no. And yet, the very fact that they don't means what happens is that there, there is, though, a change in them in that very effort. Like, you're trying to become one... And yet you don't, but the very trying of becoming one changes you in light of that effort. Yeah. So likewise, the effort to reach the thing in and of itself is precisely what changes you and changes the thing you're reaching toward. Yeah. And well, that's the notional nat- nature relation in the same way that time changes space. Space changes through time. You know, time is, re- you know, there's all these connections between time and space and they're interwoven and interpenetrating, to use Verbeke terms, and they go together. Penetrating is Hegel, Hegel terms, too. Yeah, right? I know, I know. That, that's where it all is <laughs> so freaking fascinating. Well, and so there's this interpenetration where the where notion never reaches nature because it changes nature in the reaching. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is like when it's this idea of become one, it, again, it's a funny language, right? Because, you know something two things becoming one it doesn't mean they like we we conflate that with becoming identical or something it's not that at all it's it's actually just to be able to actually equal you know have equilibrium or have the possibility of harmony or have this sort of ability to like yeah just you know to be whatever you want to call it you know have have some sort of like uh shift that's that's almost like you are now in a, in a similar trajectory or like this teleological unity or something like that, that then that is what the oneness is really like. It, it's, it's not so, I guess what I mean to say is like, because I keep thinking back when you're saying about like nation wanting, <laughs> nature wanting to be notion, notion yes. wanting to be nature. We're not talking about becoming one in this sort of a, you know, flattening out of the, the, you know, that's why I think I was bringing up this idea of the consuming love is like, it's not to, eradicate the difference it, no it's to have those those coincide and coalesce or something like that well the, well this, you mm-hmm. sorry just one thing really quick because this idea of like this effort to be one you know you said that like the you know but at least when you're making that effort to be one it like changes you you know you both etc but things i think a lot of people and i you know i don't want to get this too off track but like just to think relationally i think a lot of times people think of that as like well the other person has to be like me Yes. Or, or they have to, or like nature I, has like, to be like notion. yeah, like like like, yeah. They, and that's and that's the only way we're gonna be one. Like no, yes, that that's that's not the right concept of it because and and you'll you'll spend your days just being in a power battle between each other to think of it that but, way. But that's what happens with nature and notion. That's Heidegger. Yeah. Like nature becomes standing reserve mm-hmm. to notion. Like notion and nature are like we're t- tied together in power structures or the environmentalism that yeah. Zizek and Zizek critiques. That's basically anti-human. Yeah. Like the problem with the world is the human. So that 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 what you're describing is exactly what occurs. And there is absolutely, like, some death drive thinking that can emerge with kind of environmentalism. There's, uh, there's a lot of death drive thinking where the problem in the universe is the human. If we got rid of the human, everything would be better. Um, you, you, it's, you know, I guess if you wanted to flip it, it, is there, could you imagine nature wanting to be standing reserve? And that would, like, you know, that would be anthropomorphizing nature, but that would be a death drive for nature, right? Where it wanted to be standing reserve and thus become notional. Uh, because, you know, standing reserve is only possible with notion. Uh, you know, that's a little out there. But the, but the point is, like, what you're describing applies in the nature-notion relation. Really quick, I want to just jump back. I, 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 we could just keep it quick on this really quick you know we can keep it quick on this but something Chitang brought up he said something about the difference between I think it was like uh, the libidinal drive and like jouissance yes. I, I, I wonder if that could apply to the 
distinction I'm trying to make with uh, cons you know this consuming love and then the the love that then basically just like allows for the repetition in consummation or something like that. The thing is, is that the consuming love is often very, uh, there can be something very, very sexually driven in that. So what I mean to say is like, there's still some type of like libidinal economy at play there, but I wonder if it's like more just full on jouissance where it's like this kind of almost destructive pleasure. Like it's not, it's not so much able to find the equilibrium. That's something that I kind of associate with jouissance is like, it doesn't, it, it almost is just the, the, the extremes, you know, the extremes. And so, yeah, I just wanted to say that really quick because I think that when we have that kind of, um, I think, uh, to be honest, a lot of that is what's at play uh, with with uh, mainstream understandings of, like, love uh, and, and things like that. I think the, the problem with that is that it doesn't actually embrace the, um, the kind of the dance that really has to exist and I think the the dance is where we kind of have this more able to be regulated libidinal economy, uh, in the you know consummation type of love versus the all full on consuming love. But I didn't want I just wanted to say that I'm not making I'm not trying to say that only one has some sort of sexual component because the other does too very much so. But I think it's almost like it's not regulating a death drive or something like that. Whereas like you know with the 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 repetition, uh, you know, there's something about being able to use that drive for something that you at least attempt to be productive or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, well, not, I, not for the sake of like utility, just, just for the sake of some sort of container, you know, <laughs> like, well, well, the GA sans, which is again, a word I can never say is this very tricky idea that like, you know, we were bringing up the possibility. Well, basically all love has to have the risk of perversion. Otherwise yes. it's not possible. If there's no risk of perversion, then it's not existing I'm like, like what doesn't have that yeah aspect? there's like, no philosophical yeah. conversation that can't become merely the enjoyment of talking about philosophy and has nothing to do with stakes right there's yeah, no yeah. there's no possibility of a story that can't be mere entertainment and not you know you there's always going to be that risk and there's a way in which one way to think about ga sans the j word jua sans <laughs> is the knowing is the performative element of denying to yourself that you're getting the enjoyment of doing the philosophy just because you like talking about ideas while you get that enjoyment while simultaneously denying that you're getting that enjoyment and then loving that whole gymnastics that's going on <laughs> yeah, right yeah. and and that's where the concept yes. i think has many layers to it in, yes. in oh it's, you know, it's a very complicated um because term, like but... there's also something here where like if you have like notion like if you're going oh notion l like notion likes to think itself as part of nature because notion also enjoys sort of like the subservient role to nature because notions trying it takes enjoyment out of avoiding its responsibility and being responsible for trying to avoid its responsibility like ga songs once you introduce that you're getting into like the extraordinarily profound gymnastics that desire and drive and also the revelation of it is that we don't merely desire quote unquote things that are good we desire things that are bad and actually take enjoyment out of the bad so how can we even call them bad mm -hmm. and that's why Lacan moves in the direction of the language of desire more so than morals or like good and bad because that doesn't really it, it really just goes back like I brought up like the Augustine insight that there's no such thing as a bad motivation yeah you know if you murder someone you think it's good to murder them so in what sense can we talk about ethics like it, like Augustine really kind of raises the question mark of what do we talk about when we talk about ethics? Yeah. Now, I think we have to get into Aristotle and the Nicomachean ethics, and then there's a difference between that and law. And then you could also say there is no such thing as morality, only ethics, and yeah. ethics is social structuring, where, where morality is more individual. You open all of that. Um, so I think, though, on what you're getting at is like, if we're thinking the J word, <laughs> is the J word would be say for example speaking as if you're consummated when you know you're actually being consumed but you actually enjoy being consumed because then you can be a victim and you enjoy being a victim because then you're not responsible for acting like you receive an enjoyment or you could flip it where it's like it would be the you're speaking as if you're in a you're um you're in a consummation but you really know you're consuming the other person but you actually enjoy the feeling of doing something you know you shouldn't do because that gives you a power over the other person of which then you only want those so that you can protect them <laughs> because you have a power <laughs> like you see like some gym, some yeah, yeah to some me the j word and yeah. the reason why zizek was brilliant to incorporate that into ideology 
is because that is like you can't explain ideology merely in terms of people are brainwashed or they're um, you know they're they're like true believers. Like there is complicated mental gymnastics that are going on that makes you know the phrase I use is why the map is indestructible. Now I don't use Lacan to describe it. I use the Godel point as I call it to describe why no, basically why it is that no one ever has to leave an ideology. It's that man, well, massive problem. Every map is indestructible. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because, like, you know, why nobody has to leave an ideology. You know, yes. So, so I think I think Lacan the, actually the very original. I think the 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 very kind of original sort of de, de, uh, derivation for jouissance is actually the baby, right? Yes. The baby never has to leave the mother. It doesn't think it does. It yes. never thinks it has to leave. It, it never, it, it is always actually able to, in its mind, or, you know, from yes. its own conception, what well, we, we can't know what a baby thinks, sure. actually. Sure. But basically, if we can think even just symbolically, it, it always has basically what it wants and it needs to this is how it survives etc cetera, etc cetera. but like it doesn't ever think of any interruption to that it has it has the mother and right. and so in a way it doesn't think there is the mother is the baby like yes. there's no there's no separation and so in that sense this is what's so fascinating to me about jouissance is because it seems to be this type of this kind of totalizing yes. right and it and it ta and it's only it's over this time that then there's this kind of like where we start to get into like this perceived lack when the baby's like, wait a second, like, you know, mommy has to attend to something else. So I don't I, I can't get the thing that I want at this moment. Or the, then we think about the father figure who then comes in and kind of like is the no. Right. Then it interrupts the jouissance for the, the, the baby. Um, and so then we start to get into these other things. We move into desire and that's the whole breakdown, which I don't know enough about. But the point of the matter is what I'm interested in is this idea of jouissance being this type of uh it, it's like it's it's it works very well for the baby and it's for their survival and there's actually nothing yes. about it that's it's a it's a kind of it's it's sort of an innocent sort of like sati satiation this is not merely though just all pl all pleasurable necessarily because we don't know exactly what the baby's you know they can be feeling all sorts of things or being at flux of certain emotions but the main point is is it's this constant never having to leave never having to have interruption to the to the do whatever we're going to call it, the jouissance itself right the thing that's being being able to be given so there is almost a way in which it's like <clears throat> that's that's kind of the you know we as adults now like that this is where like the cons the consuming love it almost wants to be like the baby mother dynamic where it's like it doesn't even have a two-ness it's just a oneness yes. in this like totalizing sense yes you know but then you would never really you know the the tragedy of losing the the kind of oh i am one with the mother is then you actually have you start to be able to have dialogue with the mother and baby right they learn language and all this so it's like you can actually have you know a, ultimately a relationship together yes you know you the the sort of distinction actually births uh being able to relate one to the other <coughs> so anyways i just I'm really interested in that and thinking and then I think that relates really well yes to this idea of the ideology you never have to leave it because everything is kind of justified by it and you could kind of just stay latched on perpetually perpetually latched on uh to that and so you you know in in some ways that that's the only thing is is that we have to be I don't know perhaps it's kind of just um being self-skeptical right so that we don't end up sort of living as if we are you know, able to be in that totalized one uh, and realize this is where the importance of the dialectical would then come up, I think. Yes. Um, well, so, so, there's a, a few things. One, one of the reasons why you have to, in, in, in look on, come to kind of enjoy the upsets or the, um, the failures or whatever is because every ideology will eventually, that complete system, run against something that wrinkles it. But if you can enjoy those wrinkles, then it becomes part of the ideology. Like if you can make like if you can. So that's why it gets all linked together with like these upsets or different structures, because if you like actually like, no, 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 I want this bad thing to occur. Well, then it can't truly be a threat to the ideology because your want is situated and organized by the ideology. Hmm. So that's the weird move. Why Jason is so important oh, for yeah, the maintaining. Yeah. Are you of talking the, about what he talks about? The eminence like the like they like you never you can. It's like it's not the you know, the uh, when you're talking about anxiety where it's like. Anxiety doesn't come up because because of the the potential for lack. It's actually the fact that it can never go away or something like that. Well, well, it's the move where so for example, if you always enjoy the negativity, well, then the negativity can't be that negative. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, it, so, so it can't be a threat to the the ideology. So the re so why look like Zizek wants to link together GA science, which ultimately has to have a death drive because it ultimately has to be no matter what formulation of the gymnastics I described are, it ultimately the characteristic it leads back to a totalization, which right. is a death drive, right? Because you can't have a totalization, yes. right? Well, the reason why Jason comes to so often the J word get connected with loving like a bad thing, like there's some weird move where you like love being taken advantage of, or you love submission, like any, you love this destructive type yeah, of this love destructive or thing is because that is necessary for the ideology not to be threatened. Because if you because if you're situated in an ideology and you desire or come to convince yourself you like the bad thing, then the bad thing cannot be evidence against the ideology. It has to be situated into the ideology. Now, none of that may actually follow if you conceptually mediate it and think it through, but you can skip that by just desiring it, by just wanting it or coming to accept it. Yeah, like, I, I think that, that makes sense, yeah. Like, if you come to somehow, like, like that almost gets into Sartre's bad faith. Like, if you come to enjoy being the worker who has no power at, at work because it means you're honorable and noble and you're doing what you're supposed to do for your country. So you kind of enjoy not having power at work. Well, then you never have to question your ideology of capitalism because you enjoy the position. But if you were to say, well, wait a minute, no, I actually don't have any power, then that would like make a giant question mark on the entire ideology of capitalism. So this this is how like coming to identify with a negativity is important for the ideology preservation. And that's why like what Zizek is bringing forth is is quite important for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so what ends up happening as well like when you end up getting c consumption as opposed to consummation there, there, there ends up coming to be some sort of identification of a bad thing as good, and thus it is evidence of consummation, not uh, consumption, right? Absolutely. And so, likewise, what ends up happening is like, like why Hegel is so bent on phenomenology and paying attention to like how notion relates to nature and, and so on and so forth is because notion is always at risk of convincing itself that it is um, co consummating with nature when it's really consuming it in the same way that nature can position itself as consummating with notion when it's actually consuming it. Yeah. Because, it, it can, because, nature, because notion can always go, well, I like standing reserve. Nature is better at standing reserve, yeah. actually. And then it would never have to question the ideology of autonomous rationality. It would never have to question AA thinking. Yeah. Because it can always, like, so, this liaison you're describing could describe the relation between nature and notion. Because if, if notion comes to say, well, no, I like it when nature is turned into, you know, the Industrial Revolution. You know, I like, I like it when nature can be explained as a clockwork. You know, I like it when it's deterministic. Because then everything makes sense. Like, there's this whole way where you can view the history of the way of science. Like, if we think mm -hmm. about science, like... The whole, like, we're coming, like, the whole, like, determinism, there's no such thing as a human being, there's just Adam's reductionism, like, all of that that people are now, like, speaking against, you could almost think in terms of this Lacanian structure, where Notion was like, no, no, I, I like thinking that humans don't have free will. Because, you know, I, because then I'm not responsible. I, I like thinking that we're reducible to our atoms. Because... So, what, so what checks all of that? Um the absolute choice ultimately <laughs> like well, you know that's well, what ultimately checks the interruption that is, like what 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 the yeah. look up he was like look up do you see do you see atoms do you see human mm -hmm. beings yeah. not having yeah. free will I that's why that's why the look up is so big well but like that's and, why and, phenomenology is central that's why i think you have to start with phenomenology yeah that well, came up in the net today yes it did well i mean this idea of like identifying with the negativity and like somehow like you know, well, you just kind of usurp that as part of your own ideology and you like this, you know, if you, you like the kind of suffering or whatever it is so that you can say like, you know, you don't have, ever have to question your ideology. Well, well, the one thing is if it was actually suffering, you would not like it. Yeah. Like, like if it was literally somebody cutting off your arm, you know, like you wouldn't actually like that. Right? It's always the idea. It's always yes. like the idea of it that yes. somehow you can get pleasure out of. Yes. Um, so that's the one thing. But then how do you this this is what this is the what the what people levy on the Hegel and the dialectic itself, right? You can always absorb everything. I just it absorbs yes. it and then suddenly it's just like, oh well you can never not be you know, in the dialectic. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. So how does how is the I mean, I think we kind of talked about this, but like maybe it's the fact that it's actually a process and the other is always about totalizing that makes it different and makes it that Hegel's not just doing the bad type of totalize or, you know, not Hegel himself, oh, but like oh, the dialectic. The, 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 the huge point ultimately is that it's the choices between ideology or dialectic. 
Like, yeah, sure. You, 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 I mean, I guess it's kind of like, in a sense, you kind of decide if that, yes. that, that all, right? That all yeah, is like, is, is like totalitarianism or like you, freedom you or something. To, you you have to choose in everything. Yeah. You, you, well, you can't escape choosing in everything. Um, and the thing is, if you don't like the key is like identifying if indeed fundamental structure is dialectical, you don't get a totalizing vision. So, right. Well, so that's, that that's counters what I thing. Like, the natural. Yeah. So the, the subject has a natural tendency to fit itself into a, an ideology um, and it will use every freaking tool it can to do it. We are ideology preservation machines and we're going to use liaisons. We're going to use self-deception. We're going to use irony. We're going to do everything we can mm -hmm. to get that stable state. Um, and Ego's like, you don't get a stable state. Well, and that's the funny thing, because even in saying that, you know, <laughs> in a sense, it's kind of like, no, 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 that's the point. It being dialectical means it can never be totalized. Yes. You can't totalize with a dialectical. You can yes. say that ev you can say that we all breathe air or something like that, but there's like there's all the constant things that it informs that are constantly in their own process of a dialectical a, a, a dialectical process. So well, it's like, if I, I was to say, say every... like the brain even to wants to totalize the concept of the dialectical, as, and it as succeeded. If... It succeeded. <laughs> like ideology won. Like for hundreds of years, the interpretation of Hegel that ideology wanted to get him out of the way won. And it's only now, like, to lose, like, all of that is evident, like, the reading of Hegel as a totalizing system is exactly, here's the funny thing, ideology is like, yeah, Hegel's no good, that's a totalizing system. Yeah, exactly. As is, it's a totalizing as it's, system. It's, as it's a totalizing system, yeah. Yeah, that, right, and yeah, so yeah, you that, would never think that you're in a totalizing system because you're always critiquing the totalizing exactly. system. <laughs> that ideology presents as a totalizing system, so you never suspect it. Yeah. So that's what's going on there. Yeah, that, that's what I think Deleuze fell into that. That's but, good. But I'm, but I'm always hesitant to say anything for sure about Deleuze because sure. I'm always not sure. I, I won't make a claim on that part. No, no, no. Because <laughs> I'm never sure. <laughs> no, no, sir. But I, I, you know, you said something really quick. Just you said something about like, you know, we identify with negativity to incorporate it into our ideology. Then how do you ever really actually like face negativity? Like, is it is it something that you just really can't anticipate because it has to kind of be like the kind of the truly other or whatever that language is of. Uh, you, you face negativity by not running from it, yeah, which means the, you the, embed the, yourself in a common life and you're ready for what comes. Well, yes, yes, yes. But like the idea you said how like, you know, ideology in this kind of joyous manner wants to kind of like, it'll identify with negativity to be like a victim or like to, to preserve its own ideology. Doesn't it feel like it's actually really facing negativity? Or is that kind of not actually facing negativity? Because if it were, it would have to be willing to like lose its identity. Well, it's not other. Like, to be true negativity has to be other. Like, if it's a planned okay, so negativity... Then in a sense, when you said identifying with negativity, that's not actually... Well, this is what's tricky. Well, because... maybe it's the fact that it's identifying. You never actually identify with negativity. You well, just... if it's negativity <laughs> that... You encounter it. This is... Well, this is why it's all contingency. It's all flip moments. Everything is contingent. Everything is fluid. Everything is flip moment. And a, a negativity you identify with and want suddenly ceases to be a negativity in a sense because it is now ideology preserving. Well, that's... Uh, that's I mean, and it's... Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not simply to say, like, you know, the, the one in and of itself then automatically vilifies it. But I think it does, it does, it has to do with the idea of, of the preservation of ego, the preservation of what you want to be true yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Well, the weird thing is that in order Versus to... maybe what you decide to be true. Like, like there is a way in which, you know, like me in, 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 in the talk I did with Cadell on like this, this ablation, right? Where you encounter negativity and the, like, you're going to say, no, I'm going to flip the script. Like I'm going to, I'm going to take the, you know, whatever it is to be my, my like launching pad to, to do better, to become something else. I'm not going to like, let what everyone says about me be what I am. I'm going to be something else. There's a weird, so it's, like, it's like decision versus, uh, you know, it's like, it's a, it, it essentially, yeah, like you're, it's, it's kind of this su subtle difference between like, you know, you're just gonna, you're just gonna absorb it in because you want to be right versus like, I'm going to decide to be not so much about being right, but I'm going to be decide to be something. And that takes a big risk. But anyways, the, the weird thing is that it's the not let what gets you in trouble is not letting your negativity be traumatic. Trauma screws up your ideology yeah. and it upsets it and shows it doesn't work. What ends up happening is often we take our negativity as we fit it into our ideology so it's not traumatic ah uh, i see see yeah and that's the weirdness like we we yeah. have a choice we have even an ability to face negativity and somehow 
completely kind of like reduce we like make it not what it is like or something it, so it does it's not be. traumatic it, do, it doesn't upset the ideology it fits into the ideology and that's where we're not looking up per se that's where we're not looking at it we're not looking at clearly we somehow do mental gymnastics and it has a lot to do with ga's on self-deception irony and whatever to make the negativity somehow evidence of the ideology's legitimacy as opposed to traumatic to the ideology which is then which could shake us free of it and then we but then we don't but then that's but then the additional trauma of that is the realization of wait a minute if i let the negativity be traumatic to the ideology that means i have to be what dialectical and that means yeah. i have to encounter the real that's that, kind of, and then all of that that's kind of funny because that, that also came up in the net today about like this, the ability to die you know in this yes. metaphorical sense and and like it's funny because dialectical it has actually like has the word you know yes. the sound of die in there yes. dialectical right absolutely and so it's like i think that's a big part of it and this is very very important because it's like yeah, no, you're, you're like, you know, whatever, whatever you kind of had going on in terms of what you thought, you've got to be willing to completely, you know, you've got to be able, willing to let that go. And, and I think that's, that, that's the kind of trauma that you're talking. It's like birth is a, yes. you know, birth, birth is a, is a wonder, but it, there is something that is a trauma about it as well. Absolutely. Uh, but guess what? Now it's like you've birthed a new life and new whole total being is, is. Well, the mother you know, in, is, is, in is labor, you let the negativity become a trauma. Because if it doesn't, then the negativity doesn't birth. So if, if you don't let the negativity become quote-unquote traumatic, then there's no new life. And so there's this weird way in which the problem is ideology not letting negativity be traumatic. But are you crazy to let ne negativity be traumatic? Um, you know, that's really... And that just gets back to the whole conversation of responses to negativity, like you were having with Fidel. And it's almost like one of the keys is like, the full realization of what negativity means. Like, it's almost like the problem that happens is you let Jason kind of slip in there and make the negativity not dra traumatic, and therefore the ide ideology stays alive. Where really what you need is for the negativity to be traumatic. And, but, and this is what's interesting, is like, Jason seems to be able to, like, let the negativity not become tra traumatic, all while it can be traumatic. Like yes. It's, it's like this strange, not traumatic in the right way or something like that which ends yeah. up being quite traumatic perhaps to the well it's almost like with the federal reserve like there's this whole debate now is that if they don't like keep interest rates up it's going to be worse in the long run yeah. it'd be better to go on and take like a tough recession versus a depression it's almost like if you don't go on and face the trauma you're building and building and building into a massive trauma hits you which is when ideology in you know can't sustain itself anymore and then it and then you have you know all the terrors of world war ii or whatever right and so you, it's exactly what you're saying like you need to go on and let the negativity be traumatic before it's like like shattering traumatic that's what we talked about too with ebert like you bring limits forward before the meta crisis because if you hit the limit of the meta crisis it's too late right right yeah i mean it's kind of like uh you know if you don't allow the trauma to to sort of uh happen right and actually, it's a movement, right? It's a movement. It's like allowing the birth, right? Um, I mean, ultimately, like, it's extremely destructive. It's like an internal combustion or something like that. You know, you need to let the combustion almost be like a force going out, like, like as in, like, you allow something else to come outside of you. You allow something to sort of, like, become into existence that you didn't necessarily, you couldn't know fully, but you know is, like, on the cusp of occurring, what I mean to say is like that that's a lot of that is just kind of a death rebirth type of process. Yeah. And, and like you can't, if you are not willing, it's like when, when Ebert talks about the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, like, you know, basically like the not willingness to die is like, is what's cancerous, right? Yeah. So you have yeah. To, you, but see, the thing is like cancer's traumatic. Yes. You know, so it's like you either accept the death and this is what Cadell yes. talked about so well in our talk where it's like you either, it's like. Is hard now or is hard later? And, yeah. it, and if it's hard later, it's going to be a lot harder. Yes. But but if you accept the hard now, yes, it will be hard. It could feel even impossible. Yes. But it's it's like it's this this you you transcend in that. You well, know what I, mean? I, I I'm so, wondering I'm wondering if you can overlay this with the the Hegel Kant debate because there's a real sense in which mm -hmm. the problem with Kant 
is that we didn't let him be traumatic enough. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. we, the idea that you can't reach the thing of itself was negative, but we didn't really own what that meant. And so then we just got caught in Kantianism for 200 years and <laughs> you've had the meaning crisis because you didn't let the trauma of Kantianism become trauma. You didn't let the negativity of Kant become trauma. It's almost like you can say in Hegel, he's like, oh yeah, what Kant's saying is a fundamental feature of reality. Which means you better change your entire view of reality, and it means the antigones of reality are constituted of rationality, not exceptions to rationality. Mm -hmm. See, like, you, there's a way to view Hegel taking Kant and not letting Kant just be a negativity, but making Kant be traumatic. Mm -hmm. So, whereas we fell, you can almost say that history fell in the t temptation of the liaisons of Kant. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah, we, yeah. you know, there was a liaisons <laughs> of Kant. Yeah. Hegel's like, no, 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 no. We're going to let Kant be traumatic. So, there's a yes. weird yes. sense in which which like Hegel really gets what Kant is saying in a funny way. He's like, I'm going to make it traumatic. I'm going to have this shatter our entire view of reality. Yeah. Cause yes. what it yes. means, like if na if notion can never reach nature, that means that nature and notion are not what you think they are. Yeah. That means the entire ideology in which those are separate is false. And actually nature and notion are profoundly linked in crazy ways that we Almost don't like two sides of the same coin, then they're right? saying like, the like can the one side reach the other, to, you know, like, you well, know. it constitutes itself in its effort of reaching it. Exactly. That that's traumatic. Like that's like, like, Kant, like Hegel's like, if you let Kant really be traumatic, then you, the relation between nature and notion changes forever. It doesn't fit into the previous quote unquote historical ideology in which nature and notion are separate. They are now linked. Uh, in really, really profound ways. And yeah. that, so it's interesting to think of Hegel letting Kant be a trauma, not just a negativity. Yeah, that's really great. And in that way, like, ultimately, the the negativity that is like this sort of uh, ability to transform, it, it's, that's ultimately like what, you know, when we allow it to become trauma, it's a shattering, right? That's what it really is actually the fullness of what negativity is and should be, really. Yes. You know, when you sort of want to mute it, you just kind of go, hmm, you know, and then you, there's no transformation there. But what's weird is that you're still going to end up, something's still going to, you're still going to transform in some way or another. You know, that's the thing. That's why if you can't allow it to be completely shattering, you're still going to, you're, then you just get shattered. Yes. <laughs> like, just if you, and yes, in a sense, you'll be shattered too, but there's a, there's more of a chance of like, of kind of like the like evolving Pokemon or something yes. like that. There's like there's there's something about this sort of being able to like leveling up at least. You know you can't necessarily do it for the sake of that. You you sort of just do it with a, almost a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. But there is something about it where there's like this ability to move move forward uh, and through that that then allows you to sort of say like wow that was very hard. I've actually learned a lot, and I actually can be come something that I wasn't because of it well, you know, whereas everything else is just about like this sort of re strange sort of preservation fear of letting go not moving and yet you're still going to be transformed by that too you know well but in a, just in a, oh yeah well there's in, in a negative way in this like bad sense of negative not the fullness which would be the trauma well now i'm thinking heidegger clearing okay and there's something very interesting here where if you let a negativity be a trauma that clears ideology away, then the thing can then the thing can come forth. Being can come forth. Mm -hmm. Like, but you have to have the clearing. Clearing would be negativity you let be trauma. And in yeah. Heidegger, you have to have a clearing so being comes forth. You know, capital B being if you want to use that language. Well, there's a weird way as if we're taking Hegel and Levin and, and Verveke and all that, it's almost like unless you clear away, you can't have the form operate. You can't have a thing follow its form. Like ideology keeps a thing following it from following its form. So there's this question of responses to negativity, right? Like why do some people respond to negativity in a manner that seems constructive versus deconstructive. You just grant that language. It's almost like what happens is if you let negativity be traumatic, it then functions as a clearing of your ideology that frees you almost like that yes. cell in Levin. So now you can formulate yourself according to that deeper form um, that then is like the formulating principle. So what's interesting here is it would suggest that the negative, the, the minus one, of Lacan is the clearing of which then makes it breaks the Xenobot per se away from everything else 
that then allows it to formulate itself mysteriously. And it's almost yes. like when you let negativity be a trauma, you break yourself from ideology and now you're allowed to formulate on your own according to a new form. Exactly. Like a new formulation then comes into operation. Because because I need to note that with the Xenobot, like that they, they, they have an intelligibility that is also much more unbound. Like it it can formulate into skin cells, it can formulate into legs, so like it can do all sorts of things and it seems to contain the information to do that. So it's not like a deterministic form. It's it's a, like a dynamic form. And the details of that, um, I would say look to Mr. Levin's work. But it's like dynamic can you spell that name. L L E V I N. Michael L -E -V -I -N. Levin. He's like everywhere now. Okay. Um, because the work is extraordinary. So it's almost like if you allow negativity to be trauma, it's thus a Heideggerian clearing, which then allows being to come forth and formulate itself anew. And that self-formulation is possible because nature and notion are two sides of the same coin. That every, every nature, every human contains the possibility of a new formal notion in themselves uh, by which they can formulate, as does the universe as a whole. Um, and so, and this is where then the human subject is isomorphic to the universe, right? There's an isomorphic, they, they have fundamental similarities and that's why intelligibility is possible. And that gets into Verveke's grammar of being versus grammar of knowing the way that the reason why we can actually know things about the universe is because it is fundamentally identical. It is fundamentally overlays enough at least with whatever is fundamental to the human subject to have meaningful discussion with one another. And then the communication between those two is suggested by the very vertical causation of say a wolf, wolf gang or the vertical causation of 11. The very fact that being, the very fact that being seems to unfold logically. And then the question is, where does that logic come from? It seems to be vertically. And then the very fact that human beings can understand reality in concordance with logic and it seems to be accurate. And then even like math being almost pure logic that's, that works so well that it seems to be created, that it seems to be realized, not created. Well, all of those would be things you would expect if nature and notion are leaked and are isomorphically structurally identical. And yet we come to, it's almost like you unlock that precisely by letting Kant be traumatic, which then makes Kant a clearing. And then you have yep. being come forth. Yep. So the problem is we haven't let Kant be traumatic, basically. Like, yeah. we've only let him be a negativity. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's really, really great. And I, 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 it makes me think a lot about the language of trauma that is in the mainstream right now. And I'm wondering now if that's not actually... Well, we, we could say, like, you know, somebody who maybe ascribes to more of the mainstream language of trauma may look at what we're saying and say, that's not trauma, that's a different word, you know? Like, sure, it, sure, sure. That's fair, that's fair, that's fine. But what is it then about, like, most, most assumptions of, like, this idea, like, there, there is, there is trauma that is just, I guess what I mean to say is, like, I think the mainstream trauma is, is, how do I put this? It's almost like, the understanding of that is, I wonder if we have like, if it's, if it's not being understood so much in terms of like, this ability to reach a clearing, you know, a lot of times just like trauma, victim, victimhood mentality, you know, or like this, this idea of, and, and look like it's we're talking about encountering the trauma or allowing it right this isn't about like going around traumatizing people or trying sure. to do things that are traumatic to other people it's the nature of 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 the fact the nature of reality is that we encounter negativity right we yes. encounter things that yes it's traumatic. inevitable yes and so it's like then 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 what do you do about it right will you let yourself will yes. you let yourself be traumatized yes. by it too? Yes. will you let your, the trauma actually shatter you so you can have that clearing so you can have that new being right that new formulation right but like, do you think the mainstream understanding of the word trauma is almost like not, we're not like allowing it to be the fullest it, it, it needs to be or something? Or do you think that it's just kind of talking more of trauma is just like bad stuff that, you know, we don't, you know, that's not nice and, you know, we shouldn't. Well, in the sense that we're describing and where you're talking Lacan is trauma is what would be the unveiling that your ideology that there is no big other. Like yeah, that's exactly, the phrase, exactly. right? Okay. So like trauma in Lacan is the 
negativity would be the would not kill the big other right well and this is the thing i think that there can be what when and this doesn't always happen in the mainstream when it comes to the word trauma but sometimes it can feed like the victimhood mentality well guess what you haven't let the big other die well, actually, well correct right? like because you haven't you know what I mean? Like you've you've kind of allowed, like adopted it, like you were talking about with the jouissance, where you just kind of you just sort of swoop it into now what validates your own existence, actually. But but right? this right here is why like philosophy can never end because like so for example, a society aware of Gerard must live out the theory of Gerard, aware of Gerard. So therefore, the language will be incorporated in the society will be convinced it's not doing, doing Gerard as it does. So it gets yeah. like more complicated layers upon layers yeah. of yeah. abstraction. So likewise, once you are aware of Lacan, once you are aware of ideology, the way ideology operates has to almost like, like incorporate language about ideology. Like, you know, we, you know, Raymond and Barnes had that great um, schizo, you know, they call it Schizo FM, that wonderful series they've been doing, where they're really investigating how effective propaganda now talks about being propaganda in it. It's like, <laughs> exactly. meta, it's like, meta, it's like self-referential propaganda. It's like meta propaganda and propaganda to be effective has to be meta. Like it has to, like a lot of like in the official videos about the Great Reset, which again is interesting that people like are like, oh, the Great Reset sets a conspiracy. There is an official like video. It's not. It's a real thing. They're just out there telling you. You know, there, it's a it's a real thing. But the point is like in the Great Reset, regardless what one thinks about the sure. Great Reset, the point is that in the video itself, it mentions how most people think it's a conspiracy. Which then makes you feel dumb if you think the Great Great Reset is a conspiracy. Which then, if if it is a conspiracy, is a wonderful strategy. Oh, absolutely. So that you've always like what's so weird, and this is where it's you've, like hiding in broad daylight or whatever. Yes, that this is, is why in Hegel you always have to conceptually mediate. Like yeah. it's always rethinking, rethinking, rethinking because, like the word trauma comes to mean different things in the society versus Lacan, and how does one hide the other, or how does one unveil the other, mm -hmm. and it's all very complicated, and you have to always be thinking it. And if not, there's a problem. Well, because there's also this issue, too, where it would seem that for trauma to destroy ideology and then be a negativity that leads to a sublation, it requires a certain conditioning of the subject. And that's where in Hegel, there is so much emphasis on the, con the conceptual mediation of the instincts, the um, working of the subject, so on and so forth. It's not merely idea. There's also something about the formulation of the subject so that when trauma strikes you, it doesn't destroy you, but becomes formulative, right? So there is an issue, too, where... But then, of course, if trauma destroys ideology and is sublative, then it doesn't even seem like it was trauma. Right. It seems like it was positive. Right. And so people would be like, well, that's not real trauma, which which that's the problem. And then people would be like, that's well, then we shouldn't face trauma because we because when we face trauma, we get destroyed. And then the mechanism of tra then what but what does that mean then? Ideology succeeded in undermining the threat to it of trauma. Right, you see what yeah, I'm saying. So it's, it's all it's, it's all complicated gymnastics. Yeah, but that's very important, and you just you know what really well identified that, like you articulated that really well, because it, it's just so true. Like this whole and and I I, I do love Cadell's lang language for it, right? Positive positivizing negativity. Yes. Right, but on the, for somebody who's in the ideology of like not letting negativity become trauma, or thinking of trauma as only ever something that cannot be worked with, basically, yes. right? Because uh, if you can work with it, it's not real trauma. That's what, well, they, that, would well, that's what they would say. And that would be Jason. Like that would be a mechanism of ideology, ideology uh, preservation. preservation. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. But that's that's what's so so crazy. What gets complicated, right? Because then, you know, on what you know, it, it's. And I mean, it's not like it's as it's not as simple as this. But like you know, it does kind of come to mind of like, well, who's the crazy one here? Like right? Like who's who's right about this? Then you know, and not not that it's not that it comes down to like just like. Who's right and who's wrong? I, I don't usually like to think about it in that language. But what I mean to say is you only want to know that simply so you know, well, what should I be doing, right? Like, what yes. is the proper course that's going to be fruitful and, you know, actually, like, how am I not just being ideologically preserver, preserving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, that's what I mean by right. How do you get out of just, like, you know, preserving your ideology? Now, I think there's ultimately, there's going to be, this is why I think it does boil down to the absolute choice, right? Where yes. Look, like there, you're still you're gonna have to have something that you're building and that you ascribe to, so that you keep going with whatever you're doing. So it's not like we ever get out of like uh, maintaining something, right? But I think it's more about maintaining versus preserving. Maintenance is of the of the of the you're maintaining the constant process of the dying and the rebirth, right? That's but whereas preserving 
really does not want to allow for any of the the movement really um i think but he's but see even in saying that it's like well is that just me kind of like biasing like a certain so so what you get so you're getting at a few very important things so first off one another issue is that the moment you start saying like no nature and notion are interwoven then some someone simply says back well that's not real nature (laughs) <laughs> like that, it's no difference. Like, well, that's not real trauma. Like, you can always make a move to just say, well, no, that's that's not then then that's not nature in the sense I mean it, right? So there, in that way, you just avoid the trauma of Kant. Like, you you avoid it from being truly traumatic. Um, and so, so there is a choice ultimately that has to be made on what is the model by which you are to think things through uh, and to believe and ascribe to. And so Hegel's like, look up. Like, look up. This this is where it all comes down right. to history and phenomenology. This is, they're proofs. They are proofs. Like, history. I think this is where we can start to understand the Owl of Minerva stuff better. Because Hegel's like, Hegel basically is like, you know when philosophy starts? When everything's falling apart. Why? Why is it that philosophy starts, like, really starts? It's not like it becomes like, like um, there's a lot of, like, there's, like, right now, everyone online is like, there's a sense that there's something wrong. Right? And Hegel like tells you that. He's like, it's funny how like the, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. Isn't that funny? Because that would suggest that the map must not have worked. Like the whole reason you're now thinking philosophically is because the do- it's like Heidegger talks about the doorknob. The door, you're, you're noticing because it broke. Yep. Like something has broke. That's why you're philosophizing. And so the very fact well, that's, you were, that, that's why you're aware you're philosophizing. Yes, you were, you were doing it before. That's true, but not not not, not genuinely. Not there's a not, term not, the not diligently, opinion. not diligent, not with earnest, not not with like a. We really need to do this. Yes, the well, meta quite you know that gets into Barnes iconic. Like, yes, right, you're right, always right. philosophizing. You can't avoid it. But like but there's this, a way in which to be aware you are philosophizing, not in the aware as in like kind of toting, you know, going around and toting around some label of philosopher, yes. but like the idea of actually, actually philosophizing requires you to be like, wait a second, we're asking questions now and we're own aware it. that You could say are. own it. Yeah, own like, it. Like, so why, so the, w- people tend to own philosophy or own the need to think when the, when the owl of men of it, at dusk, when there's something wrong happening. So what Hegel wants to suggest to you is like, you can always go, well, maybe I'm just telling myself things. He's like, no, no, the whole reason you're even telling yourself things is because something has happened that's making you tell yourself things. That's true. So you're not crazy. That's where we have to think of the philosophy of right as a justification of the philosophical act. Yeah. Like, that's how I try to position it. And because, like, the very fact that we are now pondering that notion and nature are deeply linked and that we miss something with the science of logic is precisely because we are at a historic moment where, you know, all of them talk about the meaning crisis or the meta crisis, right? And so, yeah, maybe you're just telling yourself, but the whole reason you're thinking these things and considering an alternative choice is because the other model didn't seem to work. Right, and I guess, and that, and that's And that's a proof. That's evidence that the other model is false. Right, and I think too, it's it's not like a, uh, anyone's going around being like like whatever you're saying, like that you're encountering. Look up, you know what actually worked, all of that. The other thing that I think for me is is like yes, I think that's a, that's the correct way of going about determining deter, determining it, is because it's also something that you're determining for yourself, right? Yes. You couldn't really go around saying like, well, that's what that that's what's going to work for Bob, right? Like, yes. You know, yes, you could you could maybe think to yourself that like maybe it could work for Bob because it worked for me, but you you're not certain that like it will work for Bob, right? And so I think that's that's another thing that kind of like you know I think that's also tempers it where it's like you know because I think anyone can think this like whether it's like you know whether you have a religion or you have an ideology or you have a a way of of thinking about the world. Uh, or you have a way of positivizing negativity, like anything you do or anything you kind of suddenly you use as a means to deal with the world, right? Like with everything you encounter, that is going to be something you could potentially just, um, like how, how do you kind of determine like, well, is it all just fake or am I just doing this because, you know, I'm biased Because of toward... perversion. It's like Cheetah yeah, was saying, exactly. right? Like, I'm like, I'm like, yeah. Like, this is kind of like, um, your, it's a perversion in your favor, basically, right? Like, am I just, is this, is this just wish fulfillment? You know, da 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 da. And it's like, well, I mean, in fact, well, first of all, the fact that you're asking that is, is probably a good indication yes. that, you know, you're not, you're not being like, uh, 
like I don't know if we can ever be completely not ideological to a degree, but like sure. we're all ideological to a degree, right? But but like in this negative sense of like, uh, e- you know, egoically like ideological. That I think right. as long when you're asking that question, I think it's a very good indication that you're not going to you're not just doing it simply because you just want to be right, right? You know, or you're just not willing to think of something else. That's right. You know, because you're already entertaining that you might be wrong, right? That there could be something to what you're doing that is, you know, potentially like let's just say wish fulfillment. Right. But you know, at the end of the day, you will have to have to you will have to do something, right? You will have to make certain cho- you will have to make choices, and so you're going to have to try to figure out some rubric for that. Yes. As like, well, what is working? And then you know, again, then also hold that with kind of a you know, uh, with humility in the sense that you're not going to go around like stamping it on people's heads, you know. That, well, that's exactly right. I, it, it's like funny. If, I'm if, not sure why you'd step on people's heads. Oh, no. It, if, if it is dusk and you are philosophizing, then it is probably not perversion. If it is yeah. not dusk yeah, and like, you're philosophizing, it probably, it, much higher chance it's perversion. And that's a funny thing, you know, what, why when people kind of like, when people just, dis- you know, it's when people kind of dismiss like or criticize people who do, uh, you know, pursue philosophy on their in their own free time or on their yes. own for their, uh, on their own by their own means. People can call that like you know. People a lot of times, unfortunately, it's not really understood. I mean, and maybe that's just how it has to be. But it's it, it, in the sense that it can look like you know, oh, you're just kind of getting like deluded or or you know, you're sure. kind of delusional in your thinking or like all of these things but it's like no, people don't do you know don't people don't do philosophy in this way just you know just for kicks like That's you're doing right. it because like you're saying there's you've encountered some sort of crisis you've encountered yes. some sort of irrec- something that seems yes. like has been just irreconcilable or something that's just very very difficult to understand why you can't make sense of it yes and you're like well let's let's just try to start thinking thought yeah, unto thought self let's just start the basics you know yes. and honestly like to me I think what's so great is like that philosophy does a lot of unraveling actually you know that's that's what's beautiful about it too you know people can think of it as a lot of times like oh you're just like wanting to whatever people think it's and it's fine people can have their thoughts everyone has their thoughts about everything i suppose but it's like the the whole key to me about philosophy is actually that it wants to re-examine yes re-examine yes and not and actually really be able to play with the uncertainty and that and and what's funny though is that when we only think of philosophy in like academics Everybody can just think of it as like snooty certainty. Yes. You know, and it's absolutely not that at all, you know. It's a complete opposite. Exactly. Um well, the the irony is that philosophy as the seeking for certainty is kind of the scapegoat of scientism. Like scientism is like we're humble, we have the mysteries of the universe and it's those philosophers over there, they're the ones seeking certainty. Meanwhile, <laughs> if you go against the science, you're, you know, a monster, you're an idiot backwaters person and you know the you know Wolfgang was talking about the difference between science and scientism hmm. and he says his whole like project is to fight scientism. <laughs> um and yeah, that's the thing. Like philosophy gets like this snooty, arrogant searching for certainty, which again like then science, like Richard Dawkins, all these people present science as like, but we're humble and we just have a method and we advance gradually it's and just slowly. Science, it's know, just so the like... science. It's not us. <laughs> and and yet if you question the science, you're crushed because it's an ideological structure. Exactly, exactly. So like philosophy gets a scape, is kind of scapegoated there. And, and then also like very, very often the natural tendency of what human beings do when they encounter things they don't understand or like problem like family that's hard or people that are difficult or communities that are difficult they just look away and hegel says look up yeah. the philosopher yeah. looks at it yeah the philosopher is like this like look what politics does yeah look, look, look at, at what the monetary system is doing to people look yeah. at families look like look at these things look up look at them and what what actually ideology and the conscious is somehow give you mental gymnastics to where you can avoid looking at them. And so then you're like, yeah, I don't need philosophy because you're not looking at them. Ideology has convinced you not to look clearly at like what religion can do to people or what politics can do to people or how like people in marriage can treat each other so terribly or how people when there comes difficult in community, they just happen to stop sending emails like this sort of like moving on quietly. That's one of the main things like ideology will have you do is like ideology has you just kind of quietly move on to the next thing when a negativity arises that could be traumatic. And that negativity then is just evidence that it's time to move on, yeah. not that it unveils a fundamental 
incompleteness in ideology. And the philosopher's like, wait a minute, this unveils a fundamental incompleteness in the ideology. And then he's like, oh, come on, let's move on. What are you talking about? It's like, no, this, that means everything we thought we were doing wasn't what we thought we were doing. So what about if we do that again? And people are like, well, don't be so worried and anxious and blah, blah, blah. And the philosopher's like, but there were stakes. Like people like lives were ruined or yeah. the economy crashed or the meaning crisis or whatever. It's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. So the philo- <laughs> like, and that's where it's like, the, you know, in like Exodus, like remember the Lord God, the God, remember, remember, remember. The philosopher also is like remembering. Like I, we saw what happened. Like this happened. Look up. Like, this means the world is not the way you think it is. Exactly. Um, but, of course, if you think that, you have to really think that. Yeah. And it's dusk. Um, so I, I think those tendencies to think of philosophy that way. Like, the other thing is philosophy. Like, philosophy is like, look, people become, like, Eber will talk about, like, people become famous and they're miserable. People get married and they don't understand each other. Like, people, people are dealing with anxiety. These are realities. Yep. Therefore, our notions of what make humans happy how people form identity, they're all wrong. Yep. And if they're all wrong, but we keep living as if they're right, we're just going to end up in more sorrow. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the philosopher's like, do you want to keep ending up in more sorrow? And people are like, but we have the weekend. <laughs> so, and it's like, no, you're not, because when your marriage fails, you're not going to care how much money you have or your weekend or whatever. Yeah. Um, and if you get consumed by ideology, you might get sucked into some crazy thing or some totalitarian movement and not even know it. So yeah. philosophy is aware of all that. Philosophy is what appears at dusk. I like that. That's great, Daniel. And it makes me think of the word ideology, how it's like, uh, it has the word, you know, it says, sounds like it has the word I in it, right? Yes. So it's like, it, it's also very convinced. It's like, no, no, yes, yes, yes. We, we've got our eye open. Look, look, we, we're ideology, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's like, you know, but really, uh, unfortunately, it's 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 really, it looks for whatever can prove its own self. Like, it, it's, uh, you know, it's very much basically can always see the evidence it wants to see for its own case. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And uh, instead of actually just looking on to see what is actually occurring, uh, not to justify anything but what is. You know, to, to, to not really seek to look to see something. You're not trying to see something in something. You know, you're not trying to look to see what you want to see. <laughs> you're just, Hegel's saying, well, just look. Literally just look and see. Yes. And, uh, and and that's where it's like, use your eyes, your real eyes, right? Your real eyes, so that you can realize what's actually occurring. What's very strange is that what we're describing with ideology is something where, like, basically what happens is we can always interpret nature through notion to preserve ideology. <laughs> so there's a weird way that we're in ideology because of confirmation bias and all the epistemological tools we can kind of filter na- nature through notion and thus notion is invincible as ideology. What's so strange is that's kind of isomorphic to the entire structure of the Hegelian I- ontology that we are presenting where nature and notion are two sides of the same coin and yet the mirror opposite, like the difference yes. between Satan and Lucifer. Yep. Like you have the highest angel and then fallen is the worst of all possible things. And it's kind of like weird because it's almost like because we didn't let Kant be traumatic, just negative, what we ended up falling into is a kind of ontology of ideology, which is very much like a, like an, an, an ontology. It's almost like we don't have an ontology. Let me put it this way. It's like because we didn't let Kant be traumatic, only negative, we've ended up in a world of ideology but not ontology, where ideology functions as our ontology, and it yeah. works precisely because it's isomorphic of the very Hegelian ontology where nature and ocean are two sides of the same coin. Like its structure is the same? It's the same structure. Because in ideology, nature is interpreted through notion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, notion is always able through confirmation bias and everything to make nature conform to it. But it's, but it's the different, so it's like structurally very similar. Yes. To Hegel. That's why it's so effective at tricking people. Yeah, exactly. Well, it makes me think of like when we've talked with Rivera about like um, epistemology, the conflation of epistemology with ontology and yes. all of that, right? There's something that seems more epistemological about ideology itself, right? So it's like, it's like, I think this is a great point where, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, almost like ideology is ep- epsteonto, 
where Hegel is onto epistemology. You know, I'm trying to think of a term. It's like epistemology. It's like epistology. Epistology. Or something, which is a nonsense. You can't have an epistology. Like, where Hegel's an onto epistemology. Mm -hmm. It's all about order. You know, we say this a million times in Augustine, an evil is a disordered good. There is no evil. Evil does not have substance in its own, own. So it's like ideology is a disordered Hegelian worldview. Like, ideology is a disordered hegel ontological structure and as a and as a ips you know it's funny to think of a term like eeps eepstoology like epistemology trying to be ontology where nature is notion because nature is forced to conform to notion by its ignorance we don't look up that's why it's so effective is precisely like the very fact that ideology is effective as a mirror reversal of Hegel, Hegel's structure is actually in itself evidence that Hegel's structure is true. Like, if ideology as the mirror reversal of the Hegel structure is so effective of trapping people, that in of itself would say that this, the total structure, like Hegel's total structure of the dialectic as the quote-unquote fundamental property of time space, then that probably is true. Absolutely. Because ideology works as the fallen like lucifer like fallen yes. lucifer satan version of it i love it i love that i love that very much i think that's really good and i it makes me think about like <laughs> i always think about like it's either you know and i know that dialogical is not the same exact concept as like the dialog- <laughs> Di- ideology is dialogical <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no 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 wait for it daniel because we don't want to de- it's, it's demonize either, no, death. It's, it's dialogical or it's diabolical <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's better because we don't want to make death bad because yeah, each, death, you know, is... Candy, death is what gives life quality right <laughs> and that's true we're you know the opposite of life is anti-life not death um so ideology is diabolical where Hegel Hegel's onto epistemology is dialectical. Yeah, yeah. That's very good. Where the diabolical is precisely diabolical because it has the same form as the dialectical. In the same way that, you know, demons have the same form per se of angels, but they're, you know, fallen angels, yeah. right? So there's a I I guess you could say isomorphic. There's like a structural isomorphic structure there, but it's reversed. Uh, so, yeah. so then it's therefore evil, well, you know, in an Augustine uh, sense. Yeah, I mean that that's really good, and it makes me think about the mirror and how we're very likely to do that or fall into living in a mirror world mm. because we we utilize mirroring to form a lot of our cognitive skills. Yes, you know, like through the mirror stage and all of that, and so. I think you have to go back, you have to get back to, it's kind of Nietzsche in, in, a, in a sense, I think, <laughs> if, if I could insert Nietzsche here a little sure. bit, where you have to get back to your own self, really. You yeah, know, ontology you, has to come first, and ontology is yeah. inseparable from the subject. But see, if we, we live in a, we live in a lot of, the, like you, your language, Daniel, of like the, the bestow, right? Like we, yes, we we're bestow. bestocentric, and so basically, the, what that means is mirror centric. Yes. What it means is mirror yes. life. It's yes. the mirror life. It's not yes. the actual life itself. No, because bestowing. Not that it's not that there's no. That's the weird thing. It's like, is what's in the mirror not real? Like it's showing you what is real, but it's the mirror <laughs> image, right? It's like the yeah. Is the image real? But that's but yeah. that's a great way to frame it. Is ideology real? Yeah, exactly. it's it's real in the way that a mirror image is real. Yeah, and ideology is the mirror image of the the Hegelian onto epistemology of yeah. nature nature notion. Well, and it comes to the C.S. Lewis thing again. If you put first things first, you get second things. Also, if you put second things first, you lose both. If you put ontology before epistemology, you get. If you put ontology central, you also get an epistemology. Um, but if you put epistemology before ontology, you lose both. Yeah. And then, you know, look, that gets back into the Levin stuff because it's like if you make ontology central, then out of ontology comes formulating principles that follow logic. Ergo, you get an epistemology with your ontology because the very way that ontology unfolds begets an epistemological structure 
of which is aligned with an isomorphic with that ontology. Mm -hmm. But if you put epistemology before ontology, your epistemology does your thinking for you. You don't look at like the like no, n nature is then filtered through notion, as opposed to nature and notion inform one another. You know that term Verveke has used is transjectivity, where object and subject are interrelated and the relations are real, right? Yeah. Like the re the relation itself is real. Um, well, that would be Hegel, where notion, you know, if you put ontology first, you can get a relation between epistemology and ontology that is real. Like, it's a real relation. Mm -hmm. Whereas if epistemology comes first, the relation between epistemology and ontology is false. It's not a real relation. Instead, epistemology replaces ontology. Exactly. In ideology, notion replaces nature. Where in Hegel, nature and notion have a real relation. There's transvectivity yes. that's going on, ergo the intersuppositional, as I like to put it, in all of those different things. So, so basically, ultimately, this would mean that if you don't accept dialectics as fundamental, you still end up, what ends up happening is what's fundamental is ideological. And... And it's effective precisely because it has a, it's a mirror image of Hegel's onto epistemology. Yes. And so by choosing Hegel in dialectic, you have a ever active component that can fight and resist the totalizing um, temptations of ideology, which gets into the oceanic of Freud or different things. And for Hegel, you precisely get what you, it's funny because in Hegel, you precisely get what you need to fight ideology by looking up. If you pay attention to how the world is, if you look at the world, you will see a dialectic. And that dialectic is the tool that you need to fight ideology, um, to fight being sucked into the Lacan ideology. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that, that tool can help you. And that tool in of itself brings with it a formulating principle um, in the Neoplatonist sense, as Verveke putting it forth, of which is, that comes out in the clearing when a being allows a negativity to be a trauma, ergo they're cleared of ideology, and that will, unle that will allow the realization of the form or formulation that they contain in themselves that then can then operate fully dialectically because it has now been freed in the clearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so being can come forth. Yeah. And so notion can interlate and intertwine with nature both interwovenly, interpenetratingly informing one another. And this would then be the movement of concept. This would be to, to, to then position yourself in relation to all of this would I think be to take seriously the doctrine of concept. And then the question is, how do we live a world that is centered on that doctrine of concept? Mm -hmm. Therefore would be a world that lets Kant be traumatic. And therefore in that very trauma has now allowed Kant to be a negation sublation that Hegel has pointed to and that we today are invited to participate in and try because it is dusk and if we don't try it we have little chance of a sunrise yeah what's funny is that it's making me think about our conversation we had um about the conversation i had with cadell on sublation and sublating neg negativity and you know we got into this idea of there being a shadow world and mm. this, the mirror the mirroring of the onto epistemology that then ends up being this uh you know where epistemology or the ideology is right. is the thing but it's not right well mm. we think it is we conflate it we can we we think it is the real thing yes because we, we we are only operating in this mirror world we take the mirror as the reality right right and so that made me think a lot about the the shadow world that we talked about then where there's mm. like there's something that's almost identical at play and that's why it's so easy to be, be deceived by it because it, it looks just the same right oh yeah and, and you only it, the only way you could really know is i think when you start to i think phenomenology honestly yeah makes me think that's kind of the combatant to or the revelatory moment or the revelatory tool to see oh wait wait a second i'm in the shadow world or i'm in the in the mirror world i'm not i'm actually not putting my eyes on what is actually reality itself completely no, I, I mean, it would suggest that ideology is the shadow world version yes. 
of the Hegel onto epistemology. Absolutely. So, you know, if and that would connect with the responses to negativity conversation, because if like what what's being described in ideology is the shadow world version, well, ideology as a shadow world would suggest then that the Hegel onto epistemology is the quote unquote light world. <laughs> you know, it's not the mirror image, it is the actual right. world. Right. Um, which again would give and yes, I do think it so much comes to phenomenology because phenomenology becomes the proof of metaphysics. Like if the world phenomenologically unfolds X way, right. that would give reason to think that what is underneath the world, quote unquote, or what's formulating the world is Y way. Right. Like the world, like the world does not arbitrarily unfold. Yeah. And that, and that, but then that's where you get into the vertical because you say, well, if it's unfolding X way, not Y that way. What is the principle according to which it is making unfold Y way? And that's right. why they're like, well, you got to have vertical causation. Or Levin's like, look, if you look at these freaking things, like they are unfolding according to a logic that seems to come from nowhere. Right. right. So there must be a logic from nowhere. So there must be a nowhere, <laughs> you know, so, right. you know, and then you're back in metaphysics and all that. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. And I, I, I did kind of think like, well, you know, maybe somebody would be like, well, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know, like, if it's a shadow world, like, you know, if we're thinking about what that means, obviously it's just metaphorical, it's, you know, we say a metaphorical shadow world, a metaphorical yes. shadow world, because in you still live it out as if it is reality, right? Yes. So maybe one could be like, well, you know, it, how, you know, how can you call it such, like, how could you possibly know it's, it's the one way or the other, or to call it shadow world is maybe not, not the right kind of Sure. kind of language for it but it's almost like i don't know how to put it it's almost more like it's almost it makes me think a little bit of Baudrillard, where he has he has a lot of concern about like you know the clone like he's yeah. it's almost like no it's not it's not quite something you know it's too easy for us to think shadow and mirror and be like it's obvious right yes because you know you know like duh there's a frame around a mirror you know? yes <laughs> like shadows are obviously not that nothing they don't have faces you know we talked about that in our talk yes. right you can see that they're shadows right so it's almost more like you've got literally like this you know clones walking around like that's that's how that's sure. why it's actually much more it's it's almost in, much more less per perceivable right it's because it looks it quite looks literally like reality Completely. You know, and that's where it's like, um, that's that's the concern, though, because, you know, if you type, but look, the clone has an origin. Clones don't come out of nowhere, right? Yes. And so that's where you have to get back to, like, the, that's where we were inserted in each other. It's like you get back to the self itself so that you can actually then discern, wait a second, is this like this sort of copy world or is this the the the, the world itself? Well, I mean, that's where the conceptual mediation is everything. Because yeah. Hegel's like, well, look up. Like, does, like, is it dusk? If it's dusk, then you must have been in a shadow world. Like, no shadow world seems to be a shadow world. No ideology seems to be an ideology. Yes. No ideology works if you think it's an ideology. It has to be, quote unquote, true. Yeah. And so this is the whole problem. So how do we, like, have reason to think that this is more ideological than not? And everyone, everyone must be in an ideology. So just, but the issue is, is there a true ideology or an ideology mm -hmm. that's less ideological than not? Um, that's the dilemma. And so then Hegel's like, well, is it dusk? You know, look up, you know, what do you see? Um, you get all of those questions that emerge and like, then there's the conceptual mediation, like that's the test. And it's like, oh, you think that's real? Well, then it should be able to go through conceptual mediation and not fall apart. Right. You know, it should be able to, it's just, it's kind of like economics. Oh, you think this product adds value? Okay, put it on the market. It ought to sell. Oh, it doesn't? Well, then I guess it doesn't add value. Like the weird question of what is valuable and what is not valuable is kind of similar here. Like economics is like, well, you have to create tests. You know, you have to create these complicated systems by which you go through and test things. And so likewise in Hegel, there's like, yeah, you have to conceptually mediate. You have to go through the work of the subject. Um, and if you don't have a system that allows that work or, well, but here's the problem. Ideology is always in the business of getting rid of those tests. Because if those tests don't exist, then, then ideology is safe. So, like, one of the things ideology does is somehow have us avoid those tests. Right, right. And it's done a very good job with academics. Like, academics can come up with theories that just because they can't be realized does not mean they're false. They don't have to be tested by the economy. They don't have to be tested by the libidinal economy, politics, or whatever, and so forth, because somehow the ideology makes it okay not to be so tested. 
And, you know, that's another, like, precisely ideology benefits from the ambiguity. Like, ideology benefits from it not being clear what's shadow world and what's not. So okay. ideology is really in the business of strategical ambiguity, you could call it. And it figures out ways to avoid testing and then to love and enjoy the lack of testing. Which comes with the price of a lack of a feeling of being concrete and a lack of being real. Because you're like, well, I've never tested. My ideas have never been tested. But then it figures out a way to enjoy that. It says, yeah, your ideas have never been tested because they're too good for this world. Or no test would ever like fully capture them. So then you get liaisons, you know, the J word uh, yeah. in that as well. No, Danielle, that was great. Thank you so much. But no, it, it's, I, th I think it's very interesting to consider, again, Levin... You know what he's describing the vertical the the what Verveke, hegel there's all the it, it's all so 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 similar i'm not I, i'm not wanting to say it is all the same but it seems to be all very similar i think the conversation becomes between deleuze and hegel mm. uh the relation of uh, an ontology that has a plus one the new materialism and the dialectical materialism that has a negative one and if those are descriptions of different layers of the stack, Deleuze a description of the natural world, Lacan and Hegel a description, well, Lacan would be a description of the, the subjective world and Hegel a description of the interplay of them both. And how interesting enough that would suggest a kind of, like then it makes me think of Ebert's theory one more time with like as a, man, a, man, a magnetic zero mm -hmm. that's pulling them all together into an equilibrium that if they reach, the very reaching destabilizes them on and on. And so maybe the difference here is where in Plotinus it's like the one that everything is being unified in and it's really a magnetic zero. But that zero is actually a one because the zero is an apathetic god per se. The zero is the apathetic one. The magnetic zero is the apathetic one. Which would mean that, you know, zero and one, kind of Cadell's book on substance and system, it's zero slash one, two sides of the same coin. And that's, that in of itself would suggest a profound linkage of nat nature and notion that I think we need to think, all of which can help us fight ideology. Yeah. But for more, please see that net conversation 41. Um, you can find our website at ogrose.com, Twitter, Anchor, Instagram, mm -hmm. YouTube, and so on and so forth. Yes. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much.